I referred earlier to logic and hard science as closed systems. In other words, they're internally consistent and they don't really have much of an exchange with anything outside of themselves. Um, this doesn't mean that um, A, a closed system is a flawed system, or B, that there is nothing outside of a closed system. Um, it just means that closed systems are useful from certain perspectives or to perform certain tasks. But the desire to do that has to come from us. Uh, there has to be desire involved. There has to be a will. We <clears throat> want logic to do one thing, so we reach for logic. But before we reach for anything, we have to have the desire to do something, or even the desire to reach for something. So we open our book, our closed system, be it grammar, logic, uh, science, arithmetic, that kind of thing. Now, frequency of use or habituality of use has a dulling effect on people. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that religious Muslim immigrants to the West must come in for a nasty shock when they are suddenly blasted right between the eyes by free speech and all the anarchic free thought that that implies, which is something that they simply are not prepared for. They have been in a closed system which has lulled them into thinking that there's nothing outside of it. I think that this um, lulling effect is just as bad or just as pronounced, I guess, outside of the Islamic world. It's just that they are lulled in a certain way into assuming that there's nothing outside of the Islamic way of looking at things. I think we in the West have been lulled into thinking that there's nothing outside of the logical, rational, <clears throat> scientific kind of way of seeing things. Now, these are, are of course, great generalizations, but um, uh, because you will find plenty of free thought in the Islamic world, believe it or not, <laughs> and you'll also find plenty of irration, <laughs> irrationality, unreason, uh, in the West. Plenty of religious fanatics as well. Um, <clears throat> but they are essentially um, self-contained units in many ways, at least from a certain perspective, and when they clash, there's friction, of course. You get things like 9-11 or Israel-Palestine or whatever. Um, <clears throat> so they're not prepared for anything, any set of circumstances, values, or anything that are competitive to their own. And I think that that, that can happen to any closed system. That can happen to um, science, mathematics, uh, or even pure religion. Uh, why do you need blasphemy laws? If you weren't worried about challenges, then you wouldn't even require these blasphemy laws. You wouldn't even require the insults that come in our um, sphere uh, that are leveled against people who appeal to the irrational. Um, people who, you know, you say, okay, you're crazy if you believe in married bachelors or whatever. You're just an idiot. It's the same kind of thinking that says uh, that guy over there is a kafir because he doesn't follow whatever, or kufar, I don't know how it's pronounced. <laughs> but again, you've got, you've got closed systems that don't understand how to deal with each other. Um, but if you're standing outside of a closed system and you understand that the closed system is still useful, it's not so much that you want to break out of it permanently or anything like that. You just want to say, okay, that closed system is going to be that book over there on the shelf that I will open when I require it because it's internally consistent and it will perform the function that I want it to do, that I want it to perform. But I haven't established anything real. I haven't established any fundamental realities. There are certain base points which seem obvious. Okay, maybe I, I don't subscribe to what I call hard science, but that doesn't mean that the laws of ballistics, I guess, or inertia, I can unilaterally decide don't apply to me. I stand in front of the proverbial speeding bus and splat. <laughs> but that doesn't mean that I've really learned anything fundamental about the nature of ballistics or the nature of inertia or the nature of mass or energy or anything like that. 
all it means is you do this, then A happens. It doesn't mean that there's any rhyme or reason to it or that there's any great profound truth behind it. Just because something is unarguable doesn't mean that it's particularly profound. Although I suppose profundity is a subjective thing. Um, <clears throat> likewise, so many other things. Um, I do yoga, okay? Uh, I perform mental exercises, things like that. Um, these mental exercises are often best described as intuitive. Now, the intuitive, when you have a fairly rational turn of mind the way I do, believe it or not, <laughs> um, the intuitive looks scary. <laughs> because if you're over-reliant, or if you're just reliant on a very rational way of dealing with things, very reasoned, logical, dialectic way of dealing with things, you see the irrational or the intuitive or whatever as a threat to that. Again, the closed system that can't see outside of itself. But it's the same thing as, you know, say people who, um, you see this often with people of a particularly conservative bent, who they like the ruts that they've worked themselves into, and they think these ruts are real, and they think that these ruts of, you know, this, this idea of rutted thinking has actually led them to a, a situation of security or sureness or a place to stand. So they will be protective of these, these ruts that they've sort of fallen into. To, you know, they've, they've fallen into a closed system, and they've forgotten that they've ever been outside of it, or maybe they never have been outside of it. But breaking out of these closed systems doesn't mean that you've abolished the original closed system that you were once in. That's the, that's the fallacious thinking that, if you ask me, is behind this whole idea of the clash of civilizations between the West and the Islamic world, where each one believes that, you know, this town is only big enough for one of us. Uh, I don't believe that at all. I think that it's a question of working things out um, each side doesn't have any great interest so far, at least in terms of urgency of working out its differences with the other, because each one believes that it has all the cards in its hand. And now that's always the case, if you ask me, when closed systems clash. <clears throat> the Islamic world believes, I guess, that they've got God on their side. The Western world simply looks at its arsenal, its economy. <laughs> and says, uh, <laughs> uh, wait a minute, where do you think you're, you know, where, where do you think this strength comes from? But each side, again, knows that, you know, they're stronger than the other one, so why should I negotiate? Not only that, the other guy's wrong. That's the thinking from inside the closed system. Um, I guess you'd call that a concentric way of thinking. You think uh, backwards towards the center of whatever closed system that you're in, and the eccentric way of thinking is to think outside of that that circle, that center of self, whatever. Um, West versus Islamic world is just a sort of gross um, and apparent example of this, but it's been with us throughout history. You know, the Apollonian versus the Dionysian, or just two seemingly irreconcilable ways of looking at the universe, or at life, or at existence, or at reality. Um, there's no shortage of closed systems out there. In fact, one could argue that practically everybody's consciousness is a closed system. Um, because nobody can share our experiences. There's no exchange of experience. We can communicate, but we don't know if we've gotten through to anybody else. Um, but again, as long as we know that we're inside of a closed system and that there is a reality outside of there, outside of it, outside of wherever you happen to be, it needn't lead to as much conflict if you're prepared to negotiate. And if you're not terribly worried about what happens when the external closed system, uh, its barriers to other closed systems, in, at least in your view of things, start to break down. Um, if you look at reality of human society, we don't really live in seriously closed systems. The, the amount of movement between civilizations is enormous. The amount of 
inter interchange between intercourse in between human beings is probably greater than it's ever been in human history, uh, thanks to this thing, this internet thing. Um, everybody can communicate with everybody else now. <laughs> we can all leap into each other's bedrooms if we want, <laughs> practically. Um, but we still remain, as I say, closed systems in, in our own minds, whether we like it or not. That does seem to be um, a gap that can't be bridged as far as I know, at least in terms of conventional means. But it doesn't mean that we're sort of autistically trapped or something like that inside of ourselves. We can communicate with each other. But we have to understand that there are limits to what we can do. There are limits to our ability to communicate with each other and our, our, our ability to have exchanges with each other um, based upon fundamental things like experience. That's the other closed system or the other... That seems to be a, a more or less... Um, <clears throat> Well, an unbridgeable gap, I suppose, experience. There are those who say that you can actually share experiences. I'd like to, I'd be interested in anyone that would try to explain that. Um, but again, just because my mind is a closed system or my reality or my perspective or my point of view is a closed system, it doesn't mean that somebody else's closed system is hostile to mine. I've often thought, you know, when I'm sitting on the bus in the morning going to work and looking at all the other people around me, I wonder what their universe looks like. <laughs> I think this, when I hold my little son, what does all this look like to him? It, now, again, I'm comparing my closed system, my mind, to his. <laughs> How on earth can I do that? Well, I can imagine, I can try hard to imagine what the universe looks like to him. Um, I can try hard to imagine what the universe looks like to somebody sitting uh, beside me on the bus in the morning. What must his reality be, or her reality be? Even if the overt um, similarities are unmistakable, the divergences must be quite pronounced, but I'll never know, will I? <laughs> um, what value does this person project out onto everything, and how much these values must differ from my own? Does the fact that everybody else probably thinks radically differently from the way I do, should that frighten me? Like, the thought experiment, let's say that I could somehow <clears throat> share experiences with the guy sitting on me, sitting on me, sitting next to me on the bus. Can I share experiences with this guy? Let's say that I can. Let's say that I can get right into his head, see the universe from his point of view, with his emotions, his uh, prejudices, his fears, hopes, everything like that. It, I, I've often formed the opinion that, that that would actually terrify me, freak me out to the point where I might seriously think I was going insane. Although if, I, if it was a particularly happy, well-adjusted individual, uh, it might be the most liberating experience possible. But again, I don't know what that's like. So finding out that the other person might be radically different from you, or the other closed system might be radically different from your own, doesn't necessarily threaten your own. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that by stepping out of your box that you're abolishing that box. Again, that I think is the either or Western way of thinking. I don't think that that's the only way to look at uh, the closed systems that we see around us or the centers of self or whatever you want to call them. Um, you can accept them for what they are but also allow the fact or allow for the possibility that there is that outside of each individual closed system. 